I'm with Gregory Jenks, the Dean of St. George's College, Jerusalem. Gregory, when was the college founded and why? College was founded in 1920 to be uh, a seminary for Anglican ordination candidates from around the Middle East. So the idea was that Arab Anglicans would come here to train for the priesthood. Mm. And what study programs do you teach here? Well, these days it's changed. The original plan was to be a seminary with the events in the Second World War, 1948 through to 67. That didn't work. Mm. So uh, we went back to a... uh, well, they had to rethink the college. So from the early 1960s, 1962, college was re, uh, reoriented as a centre for continuing education, which means we basically run programs in the Bible and the land and the political context of Israel-Palestine. And what sort of people come to study? What's your typical student? Well, if you look at the raw numbers, we have about 400 a year. About 300 of those would be from the US and Canada. Another 80 would come from England, uh, Australia, New Zealand and so on. So the old empire is very much there. And less than, um, less than 5%, around 5% of students at the moment come from other parts of the world. And one of my jobs, of course, is to uh, try and change that balance so the diversity of our students reflects the diversity of the Anglican Church, which, of course, is um, no longer a church of pale-faced English-speaking people. Mm. Do you get Arab and Jews locally coming to, to study? Not at the moment. The college has been very much oriented on people coming here to do a short course and certainly virtually no Jewish participants because it's a Christian college and, uh, we're, and, and also the Anglican Church is very much a Palestinian church. So between a Palestinian church and a Christian college, there's not going to be many programs there that Jewish people will do. We've had one or two Jewish people, but mostly from overseas. Mm. Um, similarly, we get a number of Muslims come in, but more from overseas. Um, and they're looking at interfaith. We, so we do some interfaith courses as well. And, and um, the local people have not been until now the primary focus of the college, but that's, that's another of the aspects I'm trying to change in the next two or three years. And what subjects are people going to learn when they come here? Well, basically, we're going to be, um, we're going to be reading the scriptures in the context of the, of the land, mm. um, the holy places, but also just the land. Uh, so people get a really good feel for the topography of Israel-Palestine, they understand the difference between the Shephala and the plain of Jezreel or the Jordan Valley or whatever. So when they read scripture back home, you know, it comes to life in a different way. We're looking, so we're looking at scripture, we're engaging with the text critically, we're engaging with the context, the physical context, the historical background. But of course, you can't come here and not also deal with the Palestine-Israel conflict. And so uh, we meet with both, we meet with Jewish, Muslim and Christian local people. We, we try as much as possible to make sure there's the people on a course get to stay with and meet with local people and hopefully that will you know, just develop in the next few years because I, th- I think having, um, having a significant percentage of local people in the course would really enrich the experience for the, for the expat. Mm. Uh, when you're teaching Israel-Palestine, do you have both sides of the argument? Uh, yes, well, we don't. We rarely, du- we rarely would directly address the political conflict between Israel and Palestine. But as we're driving through the countryside and so on, we're we're pointing out the um, the physical evidence for things, whether it's destroyed villages, the separation wall, the infrastructure investment in different parts of the country, and so on. So we, our courses are not primarily political, but we're paying attention to the context and particularly looking at the impact of the occupation on the Palestinians. Mm. And we're very much uh, operating as part of the local Anglican-Palestinian church. Mm. As you come here and you study here, does it open up the Bible so much more actually being here physically in the land? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a scripture scholar who spent my whole life teaching biblical studies, so, of course, for me that's very much the case. Even just driving around the roads, it's like the Bible's become a 3D kind of virtual reality thing as you drive through the roads and reading the signs and recognising the landscape. For me, some of that has probably, is, is not as strong as it was originally because I've been coming here for 26 years. Mm. But I watch with delight as people's eyes open up and they just react to, suddenly, like when they first, when they first see the Lake of Galilee 
it's like, oh, that's what it looks like. And then they'll never hear those parables, those stories the same way. It is the fifth gospel, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and that's, yeah, that's, an, that's a phrase that's been around for a long time, but we use it here as well. And so one of the first things we do, if, I mean, our main course is what's called the Palestine of Jesus, which causes a few he- headaches at the airport, but never mind. <laughs> um, and we're looking, and so we take the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, or Luke, depending which year it is, and we, we follow the basic story of Jesus' life as outlined in the Gospel, and we go to the places, but the land becomes the other gospel, the fifth gospel, yeah. yeah. And uh, you do the Bible and archaeology. Do you actually go on digs looking at some of the things that they find? Yeah, because we visit lots of archaeological sites anyway, mm. but we're actually part of the Bethsaida excavation project on the Sea of Galilee. Mm. So I've been a member of that. I've, I've been one of the co-directors for Bethsaida since oh, about six, seven years. Mm. And um, St. George's has now joined the consortium for the dig. And so when, when students go there anyway because we always go to Bethsaida as part of our visit to the Galilee there's a sense that this is our patch Mm. and then we've just um, this year for the first time we've actually had two weeks on the dig as part of a St George's College program. Have you found anything significant there? Oh yeah that's oh yeah Yeah. (laughs) Uh, me personally not so much but the dig has now been running 30 years this is its 30th year because it started in 87 uh, we have massive Iron Age city gates. We have very large Hellenistic uh, period courtyard houses. The area that I'm responsible for, we have quite a bit. We have what looks like a Mamluk village uh, from just after the time of the Crusaders. So we have stuff from uh, material, I should say, from about um, a thousand BCE through, actually through to the right through to the Ottoman period. Wow. Yeah. Now you have reconciliation courses. Is reconciliation important for the college? Yeah, and th- this is a growing area for us. So reconciliation, of course, between Israelis and Palestinians is, I mean, this is where we are. This is where we're located. We, we, we want to see, we want to contribute in some way to reconciliation, um, not only between Christians, but between Christians and Muslims and Christians and um, Israelis, um, Israeli Jews. So that's sort of political reconciliation. We're also looking at, in, we're doing more interfaith programs to try and develop trying to do what we can to help reduce the suspicion and the fear and we're also looking at reconciliation within the Anglican Church because it's no secret that the church has its share of internal arguments about all kinds of things and so we hope Jerusalem can be a, a place where Anglicans and Episcopalians who may not necessarily choose to talk to each other in other circumstances might come here and we can be a place of encounter and reconciliation. Now you do a course on living stones. Is it important to get to know the living stones here in the land, the Christian community? Oh, absolutely. Um, and and the college itself. I mean, most of our staff are local people, um, and they're they're employed on a long term basis. And they know that even if um, the political situation gets bad and the tourism stops, we will not stand them down. Mm. We will continue to because their whole family is supported by that. So, um, but we also make a point of, of for instance, we spend. On a typical course, we spend three nights um, staying in Nazareth because I want, I want our students to be embedded in a local Arab community and actually go out and talk to the shopkeepers and the falafel man and whatever and just have those personal human encounters. So we tend not to go and stay by the Sea of Galilee where it's very beautiful but there are no Palestinians. Yeah. We choose to stay in Nazareth because that way they'll meet some of the living stones. Yeah. How does the Christian community feel here in the Holy Land? Do they feel a bit marginalised? Well, I'm an outsider, of course, but yes, they tell me, uh, and they tell our students, because typically we'll meet with a, a Jewish speaker, a Muslim speaker, and we'll have somebody talking from the perspective of the local Christian communities, and a, a consistent message mm. coming across, as they put it, we're a minority within a minority, mm. And it's a minority which is diminishing in raw numbers as well as percentage-wise. So that in 1948, there was something like 320,000 Christians in what is now Israel-Palestine. Um, we're now looking at about 200,000. Mm. So the population has grown, but the Christian raw numbers have actually diminished by about a third. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And why do you do what you do? Why do I do it? Because I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's what I believe God has called me to do. Uh, it's a huge privilege to be here. And um, 
to um, I think I've got the best classroom in the world. Mm. I mean, I'm a biblical studies lecturer and I have the privilege of bringing people from around the world to visit Israel-Palestine for 10 days, 14 days, three weeks, whatever, and to travel with them as we unpack the scriptures in the context of this place. I mean, that's mm. it's transformative for them uh, as it was for me and still is for me. And, um, yeah, it's great. Yeah. And, and what's your prayer, particularly for the Middle East? Well, <laughs> prayer for the Middle East. Uh, we just have to pray. We are praying that people with power will get their act together yeah. and come up with a way of of the societies here to function that actually offer possibilities and opportunities for regular people. There's too, many, too much outside interference um, and, and of course a radicalization of different communities which in the past have mostly lived together harmoniously but under stress as we're seeing with Brexit and with the election of Trump. We're seeing um, communities that under stress are becoming more fragile and polarized and where there's no trust and there's no middle ground. Mm. So I guess my prayer is that we can, we will see, um, 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 we'll kind of see a middle ground emerging. Mm. Um, a sort of common ground for the for, the, for everybody. Okay, Dean Gregory, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.